our topic about making institutions work is one of the most important topics that we can discuss in our time, or indeed in any time. And uh, the reason is quite clear. Institutions define and run large parts of our lives. And uh, the tragedy, one of the tragedies of India has been that we have not focused as much on institution building as we should have. Which is not to say that we've not focused on it, on it at all, uh, because there were two individuals, uh, especially, uh, who contributed enormous amounts to institution building in India of all kinds. I mean, not just one kind of institution. And they, we lost them both very young, and I'm thinking of uh, Homi Bhabha and uh, Vikram Sarabhai. Uh, if you've seen uh, the film uh, or the series uh, Rocketry and Rocket Boys, uh, you will know exactly what I'm talking about. Uh, but a good institution is a very delicate thing. It's not a given in any sense of the term. It takes a lot of thought, a lot of uh, thinking, a lot of heart, a lot of soul uh, to get it right. And uh, as I said, this is one of the most important conversations that we could possibly have. And so we have three very distinguished people uh, who are going to talk to us about the who are going to talk to us about uh, the institutions that they have been part of and that they have observed. Uh, and what we will do is that we will have a conversation around that. Uh, just so that I lay my cards on the table, uh, they will of course describe the institutions uh, to begin with uh, that they've interacted with and what they've observed there. And then we'll pick three aspects of institutions which are extremely important. Uh, number one is governance the second is leadership, and the third is culture. If you get these three right, pretty much you have it made. At least that is my point of view. Uh, so that is uh, the plan that we have for today. Uh, I, want, I see that we have just about 40 minutes uh, to cover this material. So we will have a conversation amongst ourselves for just about 20 minutes, give or take. And I'd like to leave the rest of the time open for a conversation because my experience at JLF and indeed at any uh, a gathering of this kind is that the most interesting questions are not the ones that the moderator asks or, or indeed the participants ask but that the audience asks because that is how you open it up uh, to the environment as a whole. So please uh, have your questions ready, uh, formulate them as we go along and with that let me start with uh, uh, Ankur on my right. So uh, Ankur You've been involved with many fine institutions over a, a very distinguished academic career. Would you like to talk about what you observed, so to speak, your first person account of what you observed? Thanks. Thanks, Shailendra. So uh, before I get to the, in I mean, I, I'll talk about IIM Ahmedabad because that's the institution I've spent most of my life at. Um, but I mean, just stepping back for a second, I mean, I was thinking about, you know, institution and individual. And, you know, both of them begin with the same, in some ways, in prefix and what's the connection and I think the at the end of the day the institution is what uh, provides the individual to become greater than themselves because it's the institution which raises that individual to a collective and to a collective purpose and I think if I look back at IIM Ahmedabad and I ask well what is it that uh, you know an institute like IIM Ahmedabad does and what does it do right that it brings back for instance a person like you and says, okay, well, you, you come be a part of our institution. We're, not, we're going to pay you like maybe a 2% of what you were earning earlier, right? Uh, we're going to bring you back to a place where the climate is probably the toughest in the, in, you know, to, uh, in the world. Uh, but it still brings you back. And it's still sort of, uh, you know, you actually become, you feel, you feel like you're part of something greater. And you feel like you've been actually more productive. And I think, you know, that's what IIM Ahmedabad for me uh, also did. And the, now why, how does, how does an institute like IIM Ahmedabad do this for over 60 odd years, right? The MBA has become popular recently. The MBA has become sort of an aspirational degree fairly recently. How does it do that even, be, even earlier? And I think the, you know, the, the, if there's, if there's one word that I would use to sort of describe IIM Ahmedabad, uh, it's ownership. And a very, a very large and a very committed sense of ownership among the faculty, 
because that's what I entered into. I mean, when I came in as a new faculty, what I saw and what I experienced was people taking a lot of ownership about the institute, pursuing individual pursuits, pursuing individual projects, as you, if you might see that, but still t being willing to take ownership. Now, ownership doesn't come uh, by itself. There's a culture that creates that ownership. And I think that culture at IIM Ahmedabad, in some ways, we imbibed uh, because of some very enlightened leadership early on. So you mentioned Vikram Sarabhai. We often forget that he was actually the first director of the institute. Yes. Um, and you know, we, but because the reason we forget that is because he's actually been overshadowed by Dr. Ravi Mathai, right? And who was the sec second director. And the legend of Dr. Ravi Mathai, in some ways, is still, you know, thankfully uh, inspires us. And one particular act of Dr. Ravi Mathai that we, you know, we've all come in some ways to know and appreciate is the fact that he, when he, he could have continued for being a director as long as he wished. Nobody yes. was asking him. Correct. And yet he, when he left the post, he said, I'm not stepping down, I'm stepping aside. Right? And that's the kind of, that's how he thought about hierarchy and that's how he thought about power. And I think that's what translates today to an institute where there's a very large sense of ownership. So we'll, we'll come back to this point because you started with ownership and then you uh, segued into leadership. We'll pick up on that point about leadership. But Anita, over to you. So your journey yeah, so in observing and being part of institutions. So looking at UN Women, which is a very new entity in the UN system. I mean, most people uh, who know the UN system may, may or may not know about UN Women because it is so new. It's uh, 11 years old. It was founded in July 2010. And the story that uh, Secretary General Ban Ki-moon told me when I had the honor to meet him was that when he got to the UN, he had this epiphany. He looked around and he saw there was an agency on children, there was an agency working on, you know, massive global problems, refugees, hunger, world trade, but there wasn't an entity that was specifically focused on this very big problem of gender inequality and women's rights. And that's how he had this idea to set it up. But that actually doesn't tell the full story because civil society played a very important role in the formation of UN Women. And women's rights groups lobbied for the creation of an institution like UN Women. So it was formed from an agglomeration of four existing institutions in the UN system. I think one of the big reflections I have when I look back on UN women, you know, with a little bit of perspective of, you know, we're now decades old, so we're becoming a teenager, um, is how much an institution reflects its zeitgeist. And if you look at the zeitgeist today, I have to ask myself, yes. you know, with the kind of geopolitical environment we have and the degree of fragmentation there is between countries, and the lack, I think, of a uniform set of values that binds countries together, would it be possible to create UN Women today? And I'm not sure what the answer is. Because I think the uh, other thing that is really important for an institution to be formed, because it is difficult to create a new institution, is there has to be not just a commonality of values, but also trust that you are moving towards something which is a shared objective, a common platform, you have a common vision. And the world we live in today is so fragmented, there's such a divide on so many issues. The topic of women's rights is so intimately connected to the topic of human rights and the degree to which countries care about pushing human rights reflects the degree often to which they want to push women's rights. So, uh, you know, I think the zeitgeist is very important, common values are really important, and trust is really important. Murli, your take. Yeah, thank you very much. <clears throat> so, um, I would like to tell uh, what I have observed in my organization for the last 35 years. In fact, I was a student of Manipal, and then last 21 years I've been working with them. 100 years back, you know, there was a young doctor who had, uh, you know, all opportunities to go anywhere around the world, please, but he please chose... Please provide his full name. Not everybody yes. is familiar. Yeah, so he was Dr. Tones Madhav Ananta Pai, TMA Pai, he was, for, 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 uh, for, you know, popularly known as. So Dr. TMA Pai, at that point of time, chose his native village of Manipal to start a clinic there to serve the downtrodden. And as he was serving them, he noticed that 
you know, there are three, two challenges which healthcare needed. One is education. There were not enough doctors coming out because government could only support so many. And then he started the first ever private medical college in the country. So when he started that, he was very, very clear that there has to be a very, very strong structure of governance, which means that only, you know, people who are credential, who qualified can, you know, go to the college. And similarly, you know, he also started developing healthcare initially. It was at a primary level, secondary level, and then tertiary level. The third important thing many of you may or may not know is that, you know, he also uh, was a founder member of the founder of Syndicate Bank, which was a nationalized bank, which recently got merged into, you know, Canada Bank. Because the idea was that people have to save, you know, that the first habit of saving on a daily basis was started in Syndicate Bank. So this, over the last 100 years, has you know uh, has also translated into further growth by his son Dr. Ramdas Pai and then now currently uh, you know his uh, the grandson the young illustrious Dr. Ranjan Pai. So what we have seen in the last probably 80 100 years is when from the time it started, but more so in the last 60 70 years is although the organisations have grown to now 28 hospitals, four universities and about six medical colleges around the country and also in other parts, like including Malaysia, Antigua, and other places. The culture has not changed. The governance methodology has not changed. And one, if you want to, as my friend pointed out, if there is one word which I can say to signify them, it is trust. Trust for the patients, trust for the students who they come in, and trust for the investors, you know, from the bank. So that is what I would, you know, uh, I have observed in the last, 20 years of so at Manipal. So, it's it's very interesting that the, th that the two words that have come up in these three conversations are ownership, this is what Ankur mentioned, and trust, which Anita and Murli mentioned, right? And these, it's not, these are derivatives, right? It's not that you say, I'm going to build an ownership, I'm going to build an institution where people have ownership, that I'm going to build an institution where people have trust. These are like happiness, indirect outcomes of things which are more fundamental. And the first thing that comes to mind, of course, is governance. And if I may tell a story, I may, I should, I'll exercise my prerogative here and tell a story. Uh, I did some work on the governance of universities. So obviously I looked at US universities, but then I looked at Indian universities as well, including my alma mater, Delhi University. One. Uh, question for anybody. If anybody comes even close to the truth, there is, uh, uh, I, I, I owe you a lunch. How many people are there on the governing board of Delhi University? Does anybody know? What is a good size for a board? In the corporate sector, we believe 15 is enough. 10 to 15, 20 is too big almost. 30 is unmanageable. But anyway, long story short, 477 people on the board of Delhi University, okay? Wow. Uh, I know because I have that whole list. You know, it's not just a number. I have the list of people by name and position. And the irony is that the group that appoints the vice chancellor is one group. The group that monitors it, monitors them, is this group that I talked about. And the group that has the right to fire the vice chancellor is a third group. So you can imagine that group governance is fractured. And uh, I wrote a piece on this uh, in the Indian Express a couple of years ago. And I ended by uh, quoting a Doha of Rahim, where he says, uh, Ek sadh hai sab sadh hai, sab sadh hai pat jai, rahiman mool hi si chie, phule phale aghai. That is, if you try and solve a hundred different things, nothing gets solved. But if you solve the one big thing, everything gets solved. So why not water the root? The leaves will take care of themselves. The root, Ladies and gentlemen, is governance. And uh, ownership and trust are byproducts of that. So may I invite uh, any one of you to talk a little bit about what aspects of governance in the institutions that you've been associated with, that you observe, led to the outcomes that you talk about? I, one, uh, I guess a couple of things, but one is, you know, you organizations and institutions like the ones that we are talking about, which don't have like one bottom line, yeah. right? There are multiple objectives that all of the organizations we're talking about are trying to serve. 
you have to bring in the different stakeholders onto one table. The, your, your, your point about size is absolutely on, but within the constraints of sort of a manageable board, how do you bring different stakeholders, alumni, government, industry, faculty on the board? I think that's, that's, a, critic, that's a crucial element that I think, you know, uh, we've sort of gotten right. We've sort of managed to balance that out. And, and, and with that, I mean, so having some skin in the game, Right, for all of these stakeholders, there has to be some clear skin in the game as to, and that's where the ownership I think comes from, I right? And, and everybody that I've mentioned here, alumni, government, industry, faculty, right? They have clear skin in the game as far as an institution goes. So I would put that as definitely one of, one of the key critical aspects. Important point. Yeah, I, I would say, I think what matters a lot also is what is the mission of the institution? Right? And both the institutions that I have been associated with for the longest time in my career, the UN, and before that, the World Bank Group, are mission-driven organizations, you know, with a very strong purpose. There's no bottom line, there's no profitability bottom line. So governance is a bit different. But one thing I've been very struck by at the UN, in contrast to the World Bank Group, is, you know, the World Bank Group is, has a shareholding structure. So governance is driven by those who are the big shareholders. The United Nations is one country, one vote. So, you know, quite different governance. And I think the governance at uh, the UN Women is a little different from other governance mm. structures in the UN. How is it different? And it's different because of the role of civil society. We I actually see. have sort of informal governance because civil society is not represented on our board. Our board is made up of member states, but civil society has such a strong ownership and such a strong vested interest in the outcomes, the strategy, the direction of the organization that we actually see them as part of our governance structure. Yeah, you said uh, solve one problem. You know, what I have seen or observed in the last several years, the leadership looks at one stakeholder. In, I'm talking only in specific to healthcare and that's the patient. So. If everything is aligned to the patient, maybe it's a clinic, the clinical outcome, maybe taken care of non-clinical aspects. So if you concentrate on the patient, everything else is taken care. You know, the doctors are taken care of, the nurses are taken care of. And what also happens is also, you know, the, uh, you know, viability, you know, uh, companies which are corporate, the profitability, everything gets taken care of. As you said, that one big thing, of taking care of the patients. That's what I have seen, you know, Very in nice. a healthcare industry. Very nice observation. So may I just broaden the discussion now to bring in leadership and culture. Uh, uh, how does that flow into leadership and culture? Ankur, let's start with you. You mentioned, you started with Vikram Sarabhai and Ravi Matai. What was it about their leadership that made Ayamandabad so, such a wonderful place to be? I think the, uh, maybe the indifference to power Indifference to power. Yeah, I mean, I think you know, they were very powerful, both of were, them. They were very powerful. They could have used that power in multiple ways. Uh, very but interesting. They they said there was a larger purpose to what they were trying to create, and and I think it's the sense of you know the the vision and the horizon that you work with. I mean, do you see your institution lasting you know much beyond you or not? And then asking the question, if it has to last much beyond you, how should I be behaving, right? And I think in doing so, you actually you know you build your legacy. Right? And I think that, to me, would be sort of, I mean, I'm, you know, th these are all questions that one can go into much detail, but in, yeah. in a We will quick. in the Q&A. Yeah. Anita, your yeah. observations uh, on my leadership and culture? Yeah, yeah. So first of all, I will just say that, you know, UN Women exemplifies the issue or the, the well-known saying of culture eats strategy for breakfast. Yes, yes, <laughs> Because yes, yes. the culture is very much an activist, passionate, uh, rights-based culture. And so you can have the best strategies in the world, the best priorities, but that is what drives implementation of our strategy, which is that very strong culture, which comes from that informal governance. It comes from its creation from civil society. And that is, you know, a lasting element of UN women. And I think it will be there for... But then again, we are very young. Okay, we're only 11 years old. So obviously, the leadership... Uh, is very dependent on the personality of whoever is running the organization because it's so new, it hasn't had time to really form that, uh, if you will, apolitical or non-individual you know, non uh, 
culture, if you will. So the longest leadership stint at UN Women was of a woman called Pumzile Malambu Naguka, who was the head of UN Women for eight years. Wow, the for first eight years? The, the, well, starting the second year. Okay. So 80% of the agency's life was run, you know, by what, this one person. And she came from a very political background because she was deputy prime minister to Nelson Mandela. Oh. So she came from wow. a background of, wow. you know, fighting apartheid, of uh, a rights-based approach, extremely vocal, passionate, and that has, you know, m cascaded down through the organization because she was there for eight years. She just left a year ago, year and a half ago. We have a new leader now. But I would say the institution's culture uh, uh, was very strongly and profoundly influenced by her leadership, which in turn was profoundly experienced by her own lived experience during apartheid. Murli? So, the culture has been patient first. So this is not just, you know, a lip service. The leadership strongly believes in this. And it's not just they believe, they propagate it. They also, as from the governance model, so that's why I think all three are interlinked. From the governance model, they ensure that the patient first, you know, policy or the process is driven down to the lowest level, you know, to the housekeeping, to the security who takes care, you know, when you enter the hospital. So it's patient first as a culture. So at this point, let me open it up. I'm of course going to have some more discussion with the panelists here, but let me open it up for Q and A. Let me have a show of hands. Uh, yes, I see. So the gentleman there in the T-shirt. Ah, yes. Thank you. Uh, that was a wonderful talk. Um, I wanted to inquire about um, the institutions that we sort of have in the developing world, be it in government or legal or corporate, uh, there is the question that they were developed in the West and they, you know, reflect perhaps the legal and political um, evolution of the West, Western institutions. My question is, in order for these institutions to function better, to what extent do you think it's necessary to, let's say in this context, indigenize it or Indianize it to reflect the natural patterns uh, in our traditional societies? Or do you think these function as, say, best case examples that we should aspire to uh, develop our organizations into? Thank you. So the question is really about how, can, how easily can we adapt Western institutions to non-Western societies, right? Any observations on that? Well, I would say certainly for UN women, I, I don't think it's a Western institution as such because it is in the United Nations, which is a community of all global, you know, the whole globe. So it is one country, one uh, voice. So I think it does reflect a, that's what I was saying, you know, it, in those days when it was formed, it seemed like a century ago, it was only 11 years ago, but the world has moved in such a different direction in the last decade that it does seem a century ago. But in those days, you could get a commonality of views across different countries. Would you get that today? I'm not sure. The gentleman there in the white hat. Yeah, hi. Um, what, according to you, is the correct number of board of governors for Delhi University? <laughs> what, according it, to me? It has, it has a, like 70, 80 colleges, right? So each college yeah. will have their own board. So, of so I would say that the number is a secondary issue. Any number between 10 and 30 would be fine by me. But more important than the number is the composition of the board. That is who gets to be on it, not so much the number. And I've argued, and I won't go into it now, uh, I've, uh, my paper is there, you can look it up. I've argued for universities, alumni governance, put almost a possible 100% alumni there. By the way, that is what uh, the, uh, there was a Sarkari university that pioneered this model. It was being choked by the state. And on the 29th of April, 1865, it was turned over to the alumni by two votes in the Senate and one vote in the House, and that is Harvard. Most people don't realize it was a Sarkari university, and it became great when alumni took over. So anyway, short answer to your long question, but uh, any other observations? I think the questions, yes, sir. The gentleman with the specs. Thank you for the discussion. I wanted to ask because you people are either belonging to autonomous institutions or private institutions or extra governmental institutions. How do you people negotiate with the government? Ah. Who makes the policies, who regulates you all, and who is a major stakeholder in everything that you people do? 
and for the people as well. How do you deal with the government? I mean, obviously, you deal with the government most often, and I guess so do you, and uh, so do we all. Well, inf you know, influence, discussion, discourse, persuasion, all of these are tools that you have to use for the, with the government. And look, our mandate is something that we cannot implement without working very closely with the government. So, of course, we have a very strong partnership here with the Ministry of Women and Child Development, but not only, because the issue is, for something like gender equality, you're never going to achieve it if it's the business just of the gender ministry. It has to be mainstreamed across. So our job is actually to work with, take a whole of government approach, a whole of society approach, but also work with other stakeholders. We work with government, we work with civil society, we work with think tanks, we work with business, because you know the nature of the problem we're trying to solve is so complex and so wicked that if you work just with government, it's not going to get done. And you know we have some examples of really successful mainstreaming of gender by really all parts of government. I was just in Morocco and very proudly the Ministry of Finance gave me this document which said we have published how every ministry in Morocco is thinking about and spending on gender. I mean that is gender mainstreaming like I you know it's, it's like a dream come true and I said translate this into English immediately so that we can share this with you know other countries who want to do this and here too you know we work at the national level, at the state level, at the local level, because again, this issue is, has so many different facets that trying to work just through the gender ministry will not do it, but it's a very important partner. So, so one observation that you made is, I think, key, that you work across the spectrum, not just with the ministry which is tasked with... Not just case, the nodal ministry. Not just the, not nodal, just ministry, the nodal ministry. But if you were to summarize in one line, any other mantras for success in dealing with the government? I mean, mainstreaming is key Okay. Uh, and being very clear on uh, policy priorities. Your and mantra for dealing successfully with the government. Yeah. And I'll ask Ankur the same thing. Work with the objective of the government. What is their objective? And you know, as... So uh, for example... For example, you know, the, there would be a uh, the local municipality. They may have a one health objective, which may be a little different from what the centre has or the state has. So if you... Uh, partner with them in that objective. Two things happen, you, it becomes complementary and also you develop that relationship and you know, overall everyone benefits. So Ankur, work with their objective. That's understood. It. Ankur, uh, you do a lot of work in public policy. When does the government listen to you and when does it not listen to you? <laughs> when it wants to listen to me, that's when, <laughs> I mean, that's the, that's the truth. I when mean, do I, they want to listen to you? <laughs> if you tell them what they want to hear. <laughs> And, and, you know, there are many times when the government doesn't, you, you have, so that's, so my, my answer would be, look, you have to have a very clear sense of what you are doing and why you are doing this. There are times when the government gets very unhappy with the kind of research that I do. Uh, but I'm, but that's not, the, I'm not doing the research to make them unhappy, but I'm doing the research for a, pu a public purpose. And I think at the end of the day, you know, th that's what the government also has to stand for. The government is a part of society. You have to be very clear in your mind that you're doing this for a public purpose. And the question of autonomy, it's, doesn't, it's not a switch. It has to be continuously, you know, in some ways fought for. The lady here, uh, did I see a question here? No, okay. The, the, I, the, there was a lady there that she had put up her hand. And then I'll come to you, ma'am, and then I'll come to you, sir. Yes. Hi. Uh, given what happened to Pratap Bhanu Mehta at Ashoka, I want to know if it, I mean, how autonomous are institutions in the current state? How, how autonomous are institutions? I think, uh, may, may I suggest that we not personalize it to an individual, but, but the broader question, how, let me ask the broader question, how, uh, how autonomous are private institutions as opposed to public institutions? Ankur, would you care to answer uh, anything along those lines? Uh, I would say as autonomous as they want to be. And, you know, it's, it's, it's a question of checks and balances, and it's a question of a larger environment that we are placed in. And I think that's what I'm saying. It, 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 this is a daily practice that has to be, you know, we have to do. It's, it's not that, you know, an organization overnight becomes less autonomous or not, right? How do you continuously engage in that process? And I think, so, you know, um, I don't, yeah, we said let's, we won't get into specific examples, 
but you do find many instances of, of even private organizations or private individuals. You look at civil society, non-profit organizations, these are private organizations, but so many of them are willing to sort of continuously, you know, in some ways act for what they believe is good. I mean, can I just say yeah, something please. about this? I mean, I think this issue of death by a thousand cuts, right, is something that many parts of the world are facing in terms of attacks on institutions. And, you know, where I live in New York in the United States, we went through a period where, you know, we had to ask ourselves, were we really witnessing what we were witnessing in terms of erosion of institutions? Because actually it's very easy to destroy institutions. And we saw a lot of institution, uh, an attempt by certain governments to try to in destroy institutions in broad daylight in the 21st century. Ma'am. Thank you. Um, you know, governance discourse is often very disembodied, I found, find, you know, it's often about institutions and leadership and it ignores the fact that we as individuals bring a whole lot of our own social norms to leadership. And I'm wondering, you know, for all of you on the panel, do you think men and women bring something different to leadership positions? And if so, you know, what, what is it? Do men and women bring different things to the table? Uh, well, uh, Anita, let's start with you. All right. Uh, look, I think unconscious bias uh, exists in both men and women. And I think the real challenge for leaders is to get rid of unconscious bias and be conscious of that unconscious bias. And it's a damn difficult thing to do because unconscious bias is picked up, you know, at the family level. It's something, stereotypes and attitudes are something you pick up very early on. And the dismantling of those stereotypes and attitudes is lifelong work. So, you know, I am not one who believes that women are necessarily more empathetic leaders than men. And frankly, you know, the conversation on women's leadership needs to become a lot more nuanced because it's not just about having, I mean, at one level, I do think all leadership structures need to reflect more women because there aren't enough women in leadership positions. I'd be really interested to see how many of those 477 people in DU are women versus men. But by and large, corporate leadership decision-making boards, uh, of private companies, public institutions still don't have gender parity. So do we need more women in leadership positions? Absolutely. But what I have been reflecting on recently is that you actually need women with the right values because you're seeing women coming into leadership positions, whether, you know, in the institutions of justice in the United States or, uh, you know, as heads of governments, and they have policies that are extremely regressive towards other women. So it's not about just women. It's about having leaders with the right values? You know, uh, we are entering a very interesting phase uh, of human existence. Uh, and let me share a couple of numbers with you. Uh, at our last convocation, and our associate dean is here, so he, he will vouch for this. At our last convocation, we gave away over 20 prizes for different kinds of excellence. All but one were won by women. I mean, it was just I mean, to me, I, I, you know, just the, the topmost researchers in the institute, the ones who are getting the global prizes, are women. Not that men do badly. It's just that so far, at least where we are, women have done even better. So uh, why is that happening? Well, at the, at the ground level, the numbers are very clear. Even in India, there are more women in schools and colleges than men, or boy, more, more girls than boys. And of course, in the US, it's now 55, 45, almost. So there's a groundswell of women coming up the ladder. I mean, 100 colonels have just been appointed in the Indian Army uh, who are women, which is just unprecedented. I'm loving this conversation. <laughs> so, so, but wait, but wait, but wait. Is there a glass ceiling? Because the one society that pushed long and hard for women's rights for all their faults, is China. And yet, in the new Politburo that is coming in, 25-member Politburo, anyway, that's a longer conversation. No, but I get very you know, I, about may it. I just say one yes. more thing? I think the data on this really matters, and I yeah. think it's 
great that yeah. 19 out of 20 were women. But you know, we just really have to look at the numbers. There are 193 member states in the UN. Yeah. 27 of these only have heads of state or government who are women. But that you, is 27 more than 100 years ago. Yeah, but still, I mean, the, the absolute numbers are very low. Yeah. You know, relative it may be better, but absolute numbers are shocking. Why is it that, you know, if we live in a gender equal world, quote unquote, and more women are getting into positions of excellence, research, power, that only 25% of all parliamentarians worldwide are women? Why is it that there are only 14 countries out of 193 that have gender equal cabinets? To me, this says we have a very long way to go. There's still a lot of unconscious bias in the system. Undoubtedly, undoubtedly. So the gentleman here, you had a question, or you had a question, and then I'll come to you. Uh, you are dealing with the different worlds, and what makes an institution work? If you had focused on one institution, one kind of institutions, perhaps I would have gotten more understanding of institutions. Why didn't you choose just one? You shied away from Ashoka. Educational institutions would have been better. Now she's focusing on UN. He's focusing on um, Manipal. Uh, I'm a little bit uh, disarrayed um, uh, the, about the total purpose of uh, distilling what makes an institution work. Yeah. So good point. I think the the point that you're making is really should we really be talking about so many different kinds of institutions, right? or should we be focusing on one particular type of institution? Uh, I think it would be easy to focus on one particular type of institution, and I think that would be a mistake. So, uh, and I'll tell you why. You see, we need to understand how institutions differ from each other. One of the biggest, so, and to your point, if I may take the liberty, sorry, I'm taking the, the chair's prerogative here. I, I'll just take two minutes to answer your question because I'm very passionate about this. Universities are not corporations, they are not corporates. They may be incorporated, but they are not corporations. If you bring corporate thinking to universities, you're going to destroy them. And the tragedy of the private initiatives in universities is that nine out of 10 are bringing in corporate thinking. In summary form, in the corporate sector, you can hire individuals, you can tell them what to do, you can observe what they do, you can rotate them, you can promote them, you can incentivize them, and you can fire them. Seven things. In a good university like Harvard, you don't do any of those seven. In fact, even the hiring happens on the basis of peer consensus outside of the institution. So the university has to be managed very differently, and culture is the key. The culture of ownership, the culture of trust, the culture of accountability, the culture of inclusion, which are not corporate values. So the problem is you really must focus on institutions across the board because you know you don't want the category mistake. You don't want, don't want one category basically bleeding into another category. I can't remember the number of times I've had to reach out to people in government and say, please do not give a corporate statement about universities. Do not think about, you know, for example, the for-profit motive does not work in universities. Never has, never will. Yet, there are people in positions of power who in the past have said, Kune, let's have for-profit university. See the example of the US. Not a single for-profit university has ever done well. Scandal after scandal. So that's why I think you need to not only focus on individual institutions, but across the board. And therefore, my point is that uh, parenthetically, a person like Vikram Sarabhai built institutions across all categories. He built the best corporations in India. He built the best NGOs in India. He built the best universities in India. He built the best government departments in India. And he was able to do it because he understood what were the commonalities. There are some. But he understood what the differences were, and there are many. Uh, one more. Yes, ma'am. I have only an observation. While yes. it's, we are very happy that the uh, female literacy rate in the country is going up, but in the state of Rajasthan, only 25% of the girls who finish school go on to higher studies. 
So we have a very long way to go. Agreed. And I, I just wanted to underscore that point. The, uh, the, any observations on that? Ankur? I mean, I can only add, you know, one of the, see, I'm Ahmedabad, if you look at the average percentage of women has not, ex you know, it probably be 20% over the years. Not, not something to celebrate at all. But if you look at the percentage of gold medalists, that's even, even less, like probably less than even 1%. Oh. So, you know, so s there is, it's not just about entry. There are, I, f I strongly believe there are institutional processes, etc., that are working. There are still disadvantaging women. And therefore, the question of, you know, women representation, I mean, of course, it has to, we need diversity in life experiences. We need life in values. And gender happens to be one of the most significant ways that life experiences diversity comes in. And therefore, we do need to look at it from that perspective as well. Yeah. Uh, yes, sir. And then one at the back. And then maybe we'll end there because I think we're running out of time. How are we doing in terms of time? Two, two more minutes? Okay. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so the world is rapidly moving in a direction of, uh, you know, of knowledge-based economy. Things are really moving fast. Human Development Index is really moving fast. And you have these hegemonistic powers that are just controlling social structures and not allowing creative, original, radical thinkers to blossom and to... So how would you uh, constructively create a narrative for people like me who are in the artificial intelligence domain and who look to India as a bright prospect in the future of the world. How do we build a constructive society in this uh, so new paradigm? May, may I just ask you to clarify your question? I'm not sure I fully understood it. Uh, so what is the link between AI and institutions that you're looking for? No, I, I'm talking about new knowledge-based economies. So I'm, just, I'm part of the new knowledge-based economy. Sure. And we see these hegemonistic power structures that are controlling and not allowing radical thinkers to uh, move in a direction that is progressive. Okay, your observations. No society ever allows radical thinkers to just come in and walk in. Radical thinkers have to do that job. So I would put the onus on, I mean, that's, that's how it's, history has always worked. That's, that defines radical. So like a true professor, he's put it back on you. So, <laughs> Murli, your observations. I, 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 so uh, in healthcare, I think, you know, all I can say is artificial intelligence is there to stay, whether you like it or not. You know, whatever, I, I'll just give you an example, radiologists, Probably 30% uh, of their work may get replaced by artificial intelligence. But that's going to happen, although there is, you know, uh, people are not for it, but that's going to happen. So one last question, the gentleman there, I don't, yeah, I don't want to lose you. Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, I just have, you know, a couple of questions which might take a little longer time than, you know, we were expecting, but yes. Uh, uh, there are two things that I would like to bring in, you know, you all were talking about governance. Uh, there are two different, I mean, right now when we look at different institutions across, right, you know, we see it's, it's less about the corporate governance and it's more about the management um, that boils down to the revenue, that boils down to profit or, or different way approach than um, I would say corporate governance. Uh, okay. Two, got, got, your, got your question. Would you care to address that? His point is that more about profit than governance. Um, again, as the chair pointed out, it depends on what your motive is, what your culture is, what your objective is when it started. For example, if it's a university, if it's an educational, I don't think that, as he's rightly pointed out, corporatization would not come, should never come. And again, if it is in healthcare, for example, you know, even if on a for-profit organization, the core would be to take care of the patient. And I'm sure, you know, that's that's what our organization has been working, wherein you take care of the patient, everything else will follow. I know there is a department who will take care of it, but that's not part of the core value of the organization. I hope I answered that. Thank you. To some extent. So I think with that, we are just about at the end. So I would like to take another minute to summarize uh, a, a, a very interesting point before uh, we close and we thank uh, our panelists. Uh, several of you talked about hegemony and uh, Western institutions coming to India. I'd urge you to look at our key texts. Look at perhaps one of the smartest, one of the ten most intelligent texts ever written, Kautilya's Arthashastra, use in Sanskrit if you can 
and read the original words that he uses. You see the discussion of the Sangha. Remember the world's first self-perpetuating corporation. This is my, uh, sorry, I'll plug a talk that I gave in 2019, my Nirmal Bose lecture, the Buddha as an institution builder. He was the greatest institution builder that the world has ever seen because he built the world's first self-perpetuating corporation, which is the Buddhist Sangha. That then became the, the basis for the university in India. That then became the basis for the Waqf in the, um, in, in, in the Islamic civilization. And then the university in Europe. Uh, so all that basically came from India. And just go and see the discussions that the Buddha has about voting rights, about quorum, about super majorities, about values, about all of these things, about, you know, how they elected the vice chancellor at Nalanda. All of these things are things that we just have not looked at. Amazing stuff. So stay tuned. That is what I've been working on. And hopefully, I hope, I hope to, the reason why I'm mentioning this is please, I want to draw people in into this enterprise because it's not just a benefit to India, it is a benefit to the world. And institutions are a key to making the world what it is. And if you're going to make it better, the majority of the keys lie in the functioning of our institutions. So with that, a big hand, ladies and gentlemen, for uh, Ankur Sareen, Anita Bhatia, and S. Murali, our great panelists who made all this possible, and our great audience who drew uh, the questions out of them. So thank you very much indeed. Oh,